Andrea Belcheski is one of the members and teachers. Uh, she teaches science and education and a team at the Mi'kmaq Wollastook Center. Andrea. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here and it's a privilege to introduce our two panelists today. There's been a bit of a, a switch up, I guess. Karen Murray and David Newhouse were not able to come. And so I have the privilege today of introducing Marilyn Poitra, who you heard um, speak just a, briefly just a moment ago, and Hannah Weil. So Marilyn Poitra is the Vice President of Indigenous Governance at the Institute of Governance. In this role, she draws on her experience in the field of constitutional and Aboriginal law, negotiation, and education of Indigenous issues and processes, as well as advising all levels of government. Her teaching in the area of Indigenous law in Cree, Inuit, Métis, and Dene communities, as well as her international work in Mindanao, informs her sensibility to cross-cultural education, governance, and negotiation. Marilyn's work with community, leadership, students, and elders provides her with a strong foundation for working across the table on issues experienced in Indigenous communities and through the governance in Canada today. She has worked with federal, provincial, and Indigenous levels of governance and has played a role in education for all parties in a number of areas. Marilyn teaches an Indigenous externship course at the College of Law at the University of Saskatchewan supervises master students and researches Indigenous and Aboriginal law, as well as sits on, a board of, on the board of Canadian Journal of Poverty Law. She attended the Native Law Centre Summer Program, obtained her LLB at the University of Saskatchewan, and her LLM at the Harvard Law School. She has created a number of college and university programs for Indigenous people covering financial, legal, policy, and resource management. Mitchiff, did I say that right? That's a, that's a neat name. Mitchiff and Irish Scottish. Born and raised in southern Saskatchewan, Marilyn is married to Ted Whitecalf and is the mother of four. Hmm. She comes to her work in this field with a passion and conviction and focuses her lens on relationship development on the Indigenous front. And then um, second we'll, we will have speak Hannah Weil. Hannah Weil is a PhD student in political science at the University of Ottawa. She studies theories and practices of political reconciliation in Canada. She has an MA in political science from the University of Victoria and a BA in human rights and political science from Carleton University. Her master's thesis investigates the ways in which alternative conceptions of politics challenge dominant approaches to reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples and explores the relationship between reconciliation and treaty relations. Hannah's current research project involves tracing the genealogy of reconciliation in Canadian politics in order to analyze its use as a political concept and its effects on intergroup relations. Okay, so first up, Marilyn, and then we'll go on to Hannah, and then questions at the end? All right, and I'll keep time. Hi, thanks for sticking around to the last panel of the day. I want to... I want to really say thank you so much for being invited to speak here. Uh, I haven't worked with Ian for a long time and I was delighted to be asked to come. I want to say thank you so much for inviting me to the territory and to welcome to the, the fact that we've all been welcomed here. I want to really note the ceremony this morning and the singing that happened with the honor song. I go to a lot of events that are around Aboriginal law and Aboriginal issues and um, and you could feel in the room as more and more people started to sing or hum along with it, and you could see people starting to move and sort of get into the drum while it was moving. And I have a teaching. When I worked in Mindanao, which is in the southern Philippines, I ended up working with a, um, a group of Jesuits, which is, you know, not something you think you're going to end up doing as an Indigenous Canadian person, but I ended up in the room with them. And one of the ministry uh, reps was working with me, and he said, you will understand that change is possible and coming when you literally see movement. And I said, I don't understand. And he said, you will actually see people moving. And so I hold that very close to my heart because I want to share with you something that I don't share every time I speak, but I have a Cree name from a ceremonial um, experience. And my Cree name is Aski Iskweo Aski Oasis. So that is Cree for Earth Mother, Earth Child. And when you get a Cree name in our ceremonies, 
you get a story that's attached to that name. And the story that's attached to my name is that I will understand when the deer are moving into season. I will understand when the deer are coming out of season. I will understand when the trees speak of season. So my job is to recognize that change is coming and to prepare people around me for change. And so it's not lightly that I come to speak about treaty. And when I speak about treaty, I want you to know that the teachers that I have are the old people that I work with in Saskatchewan. And I come from a very much a treaty territory and I feel quite honored to be able to learn and be a student in Indigenous traditions like treaty, treaty laws. Um, I want to pick up actually on the conversation that just got going at the end of the last presentation and again really thank the gentlemen that were doing the presentations. One of the questions that was asked um, was about litigation. I have a colleague that teaches at the University of Victoria named Val Napoleon, and she teaches me that courts are not where we go to get along. Courts are where we go to disagree. That's so profound. Courts are where we go to disagree. And I really, really thought about that. That is true. That's where we go to disagree. Courts are adversarial, they're issue specific. And so for the law students and the lawyers in the room, issue specific means you take away all of the information that's extraneous to the issue, all of the good, interesting, juicy bits, and you narrow it down to a question the court has to answer. And so that strips it away of emotion that strips it away a passion, that strips it away. Courts are our versus, versus, that's, how, that's our language. If you look something up, you'll find R versus Marshall, R versus Gray, R versus Sapir, R versus Bernard, right? Versus. In court, we end up with tests and spectrums we end up with continuums and thresholds. We have standards that are met or not met, and we have winners and we have losers. I often talk about the tests and the thresholds as the shell game. Now, one of the questions that got asked this morning, I was thinking about the question about what, what's going on? I think you asked it. If you've proven a right, how come you have to keep proving it over and over again? So when I teach this, I teach Aboriginal law at the University of Saskatchewan. When I teach it, I tell my students it's like the shell game. You know when you have three shells in front of you? And there's something hiding under one of them and you're going to figure out which one it is? That's kind of what happens in our course around Aboriginal law. You're, you have the right to self-government. Boom, there it is. Now you come back to court the next time and you say you have the right to self-government. It was this one, was it this one, was it this one? This is actually the one it was. Oh, it's gone. It's kind of like that, okay? That's what I teach my students. So rights that seem concrete, they've been described in treaties, in agreements, and even in our laws, become fluid. Once you go to find them and rely on them, they've been relocated in context from perhaps, um, we're not gonna talk about fish and timber anymore, we're gonna talk about salmon and bird's eye maple. Okay, we're gonna just switch it up just enough, okay? We're gonna tell you you have the right to self-government, but when it comes down to a child and family service case and Alice wants to go home with grandma and grandpa, it's about your capacity as a parent now. It's not about self-determination and it's not about self-government. Um, inside of our court structures, where we go to disagree, there's also a lot of moving targets, targets of competencies and rights, but there's also this magic. It's called shape-shifting language. And in the case of treaties, for example, we've got things like the honor of the crown that's presumed. 
And we've got, without evidence, and for the keeners in the room, we can look at the Badger decision for things like that. We've got an inference of, we don't have an inference of honor of the indigenous, uh, the indigenous leadership. There's no inference of that. Why is that? Is that automatically assumed? We have um, the language of how we're going to interpret treaty, and you've heard some of it over the last few presentations. We have structural, textual construction. We have liberal construction. We have modern contextual construction. We have interpretation. We have purposive interpretation. Treaties are sui generis. They're different. They're not quite domestic. They're not quite international. They're something else. We have the tests um, and promises from the Sundance and, and um, Siwi decisions. We have ambiguities resolved in the favor of the Indians from Noah Jijic and Taylor and Williams. We have evidence how parties understood the treaty, the early Taylor Williams decision. We can even have oral evidence. This is what we do when we get into litigation. And Dalgamuk and recently in the Chilcotin trial decisions were very, very heavily weighted with what is our oral tradition and that we're going to honor those. We've got an old case that says, an old horse decision that says you only go to those things if there's an ambiguity, if there's something that you don't quite understand. And so then you're allowed to go to oral history. And so I'm just going to do a little, a little footnote about oral history. Really, is our history oral? I think our history is contextual. Because if you go to the first time a child is taught their first plant, in my community, it's the bee sting plant. Now, why would that be? That would be because that's probably the first medicine they're going to need and find for themselves. And they're going to find it in the summertime. And so they're taught in the context, through the story, with the plant, and they taste the plant and smell the plant and know that plant. Yeah, that looks oral, but it actually looks like a lot more than that to me. And the previous presentation about our history and where you find it and the archaeological evidence attests to things like that. We have interpretation rules, generous, but realistic, enough to reflect the intention of both parties, not just Huron. So you can see that these tests that we have in litigation to interpret treaties kind of move depending on the question, the parties, the judge. Um, we choose from possible, all of the possible interpretations we can about what treaties say, and we reconcile that. This is a language that starts in Siwi, and it's expanded into the Marshall decisions, the tests that expand um, reconciliation between the Indians, Hurons in that decision, and the conquerors. Tests that make distinct practices real, okay, we will recognize you have an Aboriginal or treaty right, but you have to prove it's a distinct, uh, it's from your distinct or is that distinctive culture. So we've got some magic in the language. Uh, treaty rights are not frozen in time. They, however, can only be used if they're consistent with what you always did in the past. Vanderpeet, Sapier, and Gray, what's your historic practice? And they have to be consistent ultimately with domestic ceremonial and subsistence or a moderate livelihood. Not quite sure how that language starts to pop up, but it definitely does. So that's some of the language of the court. It looks like they're putting tests in front of us and then they kind of slip over and the tests move a little bit. And so what happens to us as litigants when you go into that, uh, that kind of space is you kind of start to mash yourself into the box that the court is prepared to hear you in. You have to follow, are you Aboriginal? Well, what's the test for that? We don't have our own test for that. The courts will have the test for that. Somebody said this morning, we, we know who we are. But that's not how we get into the court, right? So we have to make sure we're, ch we're checking all the boxes of the court. Are you Aboriginal? Let's look at sections 35 and see what that says. 
Um, are you, do you, do you have standing to come into the courtroom? What is the right that you're claiming? Is it an Aboriginal or treaty right? That's our uh, language now since 1982. And so now there's this debate, is a treaty right an Aboriginal right? Is Aboriginal right a superseding right that encompasses treaty rights? Are they two completely separate things? What's Aboriginal title and how does that compare to treaty rights? And so we're constantly trying to go, okay, this is what that decision said. It was a win. Let's go running to that language and see if we fit in it. Okay. The early treaty cases tests began to be articulated in the mid 60s. So it's, it goes back to the 60s into the White and Bob era, the cases that started it. And it goes back that far because of a reason that you were told over lunchtime. Indigenous people weren't allowed to hire lawyers to litigate until the 50s. And so by the time that litigation starts and it moves up into the Supreme Court level, it's a decade has gone by. So what else do we know about litigation? Is it it's expensive? and it's consuming, it's time consuming. Um, the cases as they evolve and talk to us about how treaty rights are gonna be interpreted is really interesting as well. And, and it becomes kind of a sport of interpretation and it continues today. Chief Justice McLaughlin, as, as she's known today, was um, her decision in the Marshall case where she gives a nine-part test as to whether or not there is a treaty right and how treaties will be interpreted, it was a dissenting opinion. She ends up in a Marshall and Bernard decision later where she's basically the last person standing from the Marshall decision where she was in dissent, so she wrote the one opinion that was going against what everybody else said, and she's the last one standing. So she now reinterprets what Marshall has to say, and she goes into the Marshall, into the Mar uh, Marshall Bernard decision. And that decision is so much fun to teach because Chief Justice McLaughlin goes on and on and on about how to include an Aboriginal perspective in treaty interpretation. I think, I think it's like 42 times you must take the Aboriginal perspective into consideration. The Aboriginal perspective is important and we wouldn't move forward in today's times without taking it into consideration. The Aboriginal perspective is of the utmost importance. In order to reconcile the Crown's intention and the sovereignty of Aboriginal people, you must take the Aboriginal perspective into consideration. And that's where it ends. Even though she states the test, over and over and over, or maybe the test is a strong word, it's never actually applied. They never actually tell you what you do to get an Aboriginal perspective, to measure it against a non-Aboriginal perspective. So the bottom line is, treaty interpretation in litigation's been a mechanism that holds Indigenous people as incapable, incompetent, abused, poor, and dependent. We have to resolve ambiguities in favor of the Indians because they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't understand. It was a different language. It was written. They might not have understood completely what was going on. The rights are recognized to ensure the honor of the crown, domestic, uh, moderate uh, livelihood, sustenance, and ceremonial rights are prospered. Um, you have to do what you did pre-contact because that's what the parties agreed to at the time. Whatever right you claim is whatever right you had at the time. The way I look at this is to say that the way litigation works for Aboriginal people is you will never have a commercial right ever. The commercial rights are something that are evolved and indigenous people don't have access to the evolution of those rights. The only people that have access to commercial rights are the non-indigenous signatories to treaty. So courts are very comfortable being benevolent. It's the goodwill of the court to say you can have this or do this or say that but let's look at how far it will actually get us. It's problematic because it's paternalistic. 
it, its views of Indigenous history, governance, society, and our contributions to Canada to date are inconsistent with a nation-to-nation -nation agreement upon which the entire constitution of this country rests. If we recognize the dishonor of the crown, it's a beehive no one wants to disturb. It will loosen the fabric of this country instantaneously. The concepts of de jure, de facto sovereign are, disturb are disturbing as well. They'll disturb the balance of the crown's power of our environmental circumstance and bonds and relationships and corporate environments are impacted by that as well. So we've now got partnerships developing in terms of environmental issues that we've never had before. And it's going outside of government, which are relationships that are happening on a pretty regular basis. So if litigation is where we go to disagree, and here's the heart of what I really wanna talk about today, where do we go to agree? What are we going to do to agree? And we can call it all kinds of things. We can call it reconciliation. We can call it relationship building. We can call it modern treaty making. We can call it all kinds of things. But where are we going to do that? Where do we go to disagree if we want things to work together and work with settler people? Well, we'd have to include all parties. And I think we've tried the litigation. And I think we've tried negotiation. So what if we started to look someplace else, someplace that's not as obvious? And I'm going to go back and tell you and remind you that I've told you my teachers are old people. And if we go to old people and we start learning about the treaty relationship and what was actually being created at that time, we use the word treaty now because it's got international finesse and we've, we've been using it for quite a while. And, you know, in different communities, there'll be different things that we'll call it. But you've also heard today that there were, there were compacts or treaties between Indigenous people all the time. And you've also heard that they were so rich, people would give their children to each other. I tease my students that Stephen Harper has a couple of kids. We could work with that. So now it's Justin. He's got three. Where could we move on that? that that was the basis. So again, we've made contributions. We know about confederacy and, and the, the seeds of uh, constitutionalism, and we know about treaty making. We come from those kinds of relationships. So what if we start to go back to the people who understood what those are? Blasphemy. Let's actually set up an indigenous body that's going to review the treaty relationship. What would that look like? I have some believers. Um, what would that look like? Does it seem scary? Because one of the things that when you're talking about courts and you're talking about Indigenous people is if you go into a litigation process, one of the models that we hold and revere in litigation is objectivity. We've got an outside objective observer. Unless you're Indigenous and you're looking at it, then you've got a subjective bias observer. Okay, There's two completely different standards going on there. So if we go and, and say, let's put this into, a, into an indigenous court, what would that look like? I have five minutes to say what would that look like. So I'm just going to say, let's talk about what some of those laws would look like. Um, you have to include everybody. You have to be respectful. Um, you, have to, you have to be honest. We could use the seven teachings. You have to have... <coughs> Courage, wisdom, honesty, humility, respect, truth, love. It actually is nation to nation. There would be a presumption of honor from every perspective. You have to share, and you can't take more than you need. There's a requirement of reciprocity. There's an understanding that the, the relationship that you've created has a spirit. So rather than a litigious perspective where it's like a post-mortem dissection of how did this thing die, you're actually looking at the life of the treaty and what exists and what you created together. You would look at the current situation with the benefit of history and resolve what's happening here right now. Sorry, guys. Resolve what's happening in front of you 
in order for the relationship to maintain itself and be healthy and move forward together. Your children's children would be the test of whether or not the decision was healthy. All of our children's children, and you know, I call myself a half-breed, it sometimes makes people uncomfortable, but I've been a half-breed all my life. From the time I grew up, I was always called a half-breed, and I don't exist unless I'm the children's children of a few different groups of people. Uh, there's oral history, and as I mentioned before, that's extremely contextual. Inherent rights. I worked with a young man in Saskatchewan when I was doing a paper on what inherent rights are, and he said, I have a treaty right to hunt, but I have an inherent right to the ceremony and the teaching and the game and what else did he tell me? The language and the livelihood from that hunt, because it comes from a time when livelihood was taken from the hunt, and then to teach it in turn myself. That's my inherent right. 21-year-old guy in Saskatoon, just an awesome, awesome teacher. Imagine if that's the lens through which you look at inherency. If you use indigenous laws, you're gonna come up against natural laws, spiritual laws, and man-made laws. Because spiritual laws and natural laws have natural consequences. And so we could use those kinds of filters to talk about fracking. What is the natural consequence for your children's children and for us today in terms of how, what our relationship with the mother looks like? We would have ceremony. And we have ceremony for a reason. Ceremony is what you do to have every cell in your body engage in, in what's going on and to bear witness to the, to the four-legged, to the crawlers, to the swimmers, to the flyers, and to the rooted, who are also all our relations. I bring an elder into my class with environmental students, and at one point we were sitting outside it was late in the summer and she didn't want to come. She gets mad at me when I take her with students. I don't know what I'm gonna to say to all these guys. They think they know everything anyway and what do you got me here for? And fireflies came out and she said, you see that, the fireflies are out. Now I can't pick my medicines. And the scientist that was with us said, what did she say? And I said, she says she can't pick her medicines because the fireflies are out. And he says, what does that have to do with anything? And she says, I have a contract with the fireflies. I won't take once they show up, and I will never, ever take it all. They get some. So what if that was one of the tests? What is our obligation? Because from an indigenous lens, we wouldn't talk about rights. We would talk about responsibilities. That's the indigenous law perspective. If you use indigenous perspectives, one of the practices I was taught here was to put sage in my shoes and to smudge my feet. So that everywhere I travel and the places I go and the people I meet, I go to with the best intention and with humility. How would you like to be judged by that court? Would you feel safe? Would you feel honored? Would you feel respected? So I think We've taken a long time to look at litigation and see if that works for us, and it's time to try something else. And I'd like you to be comfortable enough to think about going really out on the edge and doing something else. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Marilyn. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Hannah, and hopefully maybe I'll provide a little bit of a complimentary perspective, because I really want to think about these kinds of questions from the perspective of the responsibilities of, of non-Indigenous peoples in, in Canada. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, before I get started, I just wanted to take a moment to thank Imelda, Elders uh, Imelda Purley and George Paul, as well as um, David Purley and Chris Brooks for welcoming us here for this gathering on Wollastoquay territory and for the beautiful ceremonies and songs they shared with us last night and this morning. 
There's something particularly important for me about partic participating in this particular conversation because I was born in Fredericton and while I only lived here for a short time, my life as a Canadian began in this place. And that connection remains important to me as I explore the concept and process of reconciliation and try to understand how treaties are a part of this. My family now lives in Mi'kmaq territory in Nova Scotia. And so despite having lived outside of the Maritimes for two thirds of my life, I still feel in some way connected to the peace and friendship treaties. Um, I did want to begin though by noting that when I began the research that I want to talk about today, I was living out on Wasanich and Lekwungen territory on Vancouver Island. And my thinking about treaties was shaped by a very different geographical, historical, and political context. Most of the source material I was drawing on dealt with contemporary negotiations in British Columbia and the Northwest Territories. The critiques I outline of Canada's approach to treaty negotiations are largely based on those cases, as well as on the broader historical disjuncture between Indigenous and European understandings of the significance of treaty making. I admit to being less familiar with the detailed history of the peace and friendship treaties. That's really what I came here to learn about. Um, however, I believe that the conception that I arrive at is applicable in this context too, particularly um, after this morning listening to Stephen Augustine um, talk about the ceremonies around treaty making and that idea of um, not being able to break the promises until the, the words are, I, I love the imagery of bringing back the words from those they'd been entrusted to and unwrapping them and, and um, talking them over again until a, a new agreement is reached. And I think you'll see what I mean about the, the connection uh, as I get into this a little bit. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to your thoughts on these connections too when we get to the discussion period later. So first, I'd like to outline some issues with the state's approach to reconciliation and to treaty negotiations. Then I will talk about an alternative approach to conceptualizing these processes and the relationship between them that has emerged in contemporary political theory and how I think it offers us a way through some of the problems that we are facing. I wanted to just acknowledge, I know there's something that seems maybe a little bit dissonant about once again invoking Western political theory to revision the relationship with indigenous peoples. Um, but I think there's something also important about, about this because um, one of the challenges that we face in trying to understand how to rework this relationship is thinking about our, our differences and the differences in our ways of life and our ways of knowing. Um, and what I want to talk about here is a tradition in, in Western political theory, a something that comes out of non-Indigenous traditions that still gives us a new way of thinking about political relationships that brings us perhaps to a, a place where, uh, a closer place for, for thinking about the connections, that we have something in our own traditions that brings us to a place where the, the ways that the treaty negotiations and, and relationships are described to us by indigenous peoples don't necessarily need to look so unfamiliar. Um, so uh, I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, both the state's approach to reconciliation up to this point and the processes that have been put in place to address issues around treaties and land claims are shaped by a number of internal problems. They also both suffer from the way in which they have been conceptually divorced from each other. On the one hand, we have a reconciliation process that is centered around the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, which established the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, along with providing compensation for survivors of the residential schools and funding for healing and commemoration initiatives. While this process addresses a very significant component of colonial policy, its mandate is limited to the matter of residential schools. And this narrow focus excludes a host of other aspects of colonization. Up to now, at the federal level at least, reconciliation seems to have been conceptualized in this limited way, evidenced, for instance, by the way the Harper government continually responded to questions about its responsibility for reconciliation, with variations on the statement that it remained committed to fulfilling its obligations under the settlement agreement. Reconciliation thus conceptualized is specifically focused on addressing only the history of residential schools and is oriented towards achieving closure, as the implication is that the obligations will come to some kind of conclusion. Crucially omitted in this narrow version of reconciliation are all questions of dispossession, treaties, and land claims. I just wanted to quickly clarify here that 
I'm talking about the government's approach to reconciliation here and not the way that it's been envisioned by the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which despite the limited mandate it was given, did make a significant effort to connect the history of residential schools with treaties, dispossession, and its, rec its wide-ranging recommendations have um, included a number of recommendations that, that do deal with treaties. So on the other hand, the Canadian government has established processes for negotiating treaties in parts of the country where they are lacking and for addressing grievances related to unfulfilled treaty obligations. However, while the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has been explicitly focused on healing and addressing experiences of individual and social suffering, grappling with the emotional, psychological, and spiritual harms of colonization, these questions are often refused admittance at the treaty negotiating table. A frequently voiced sentiment from government negotiators during treaty negotiations in BC, for instance, is that they are not here to talk about the past. They are here to talk about the future. This points to a critical disconnect between how the parties understand the relationship between past, present, and future, as well as between the emotional, psychological, spiritual, and social harms and the material harms of colonialism. It is imperative that we address this disconnect in the way that we conceive the meaning and process of reconciliation. Despite what the process is set up to address historical grievances might suggest, these various elements of colonialism are not issues that can be neatly separated, but rather are intimately interconnected in the way they shape Indigenous people's experiences and their claims for justice. The way in which non-Indigenous people understand the relationship between different historical events and aspects of colonialism also shapes the way in which we understand our relationships to indigenous peoples. If we fail to grasp the interconnected nature of the harms in question, we will be unable to form a just approach to redress. <clears throat> as it stands, both modern treaty negotiations and the reconciliation process as envisioned through the settlement agreement have been criticized for being narrow in scope with respect to the injustices they address, for being overly fixated on certainty and closure, for failing to address the unjust structure of power relations and grapple with competing visions of sovereignty and authority, and for being asymmetrical with respect to power and to participation. At the treaty table, the power wielded by non-Indigenous negotiators and the mandates they have been given translates into an inability or unwillingness to discuss historical injustices and their links to contemporary suffering which are then sometimes even mobilized as reasons to forego discussing history and move that much more quickly toward final agreement. Indigenous peoples are given the opportunity to discuss these injustices through the truth and reconciliation process, but this has not been matched by an equal participation by the perpetrators of those injustices or the non-Indigenous Canadian citizens who have benefited in myriad ways from colonialism, thus leaving a substantial part of the story unaccounted for. <clears throat> There is a significant divergence between the state's approach to reconciliation and the vision of transitional justice put forward by indigenous peoples. It has been suggested by Courtney Young that one way of understanding this divergence is that the government is seeking to build a wall between the past and the present, while indigenous peoples are seeking to build a bridge between them. The government mobilizes mechanisms such as political apology or the TRC to separate contemporary Canadian society that is making amends from the previous Canadian society that had perpetrated the injustices. While Indigenous peoples use those same mechanisms to highlight the interconnection of historical and contemporary injustices. <clears throat> An approach that sees the injustices in question as being firmly located in the past, that separates specific harms from a broader context of injustice, and that conceptualizes taking responsibility for these harms as a process of achieving closure in many ways serves to misrecognize and to perpetuate injustice instead of to redress it. These critical assessments of the state's approach to redress in Canada point to the need for a different vision of reconciliation and treaty relations. Instead of being narrowly defined and focused on closure, this vision needs to be ongoing and open-ended, a dialogue through which the relationship can be continually defined and redefined as we work to achieve greater understanding and face new challenges that emerge. Instead of placing a disproportionate burden on one party, it needs to be reciprocal, to involve engagement from both parties with each other's histories, experiences, and perspectives. <clears throat>
Instead of how we have historically done things, the relationship must be negotiated between groups rather than imposed by one on the other. A vision of reconciliation that embodies this characterization of a reciprocal, ongoing, and open-ended relationship that is respectful of diverse conceptions of history has begun to emerge in recent political theory in the work of scholars of agonistic democracy, such as Andrew Schapp, Paul Muldoon, and James Tully. These scholars draw on the principles of ongoing dialogue and inherent contestation that underpin agonistic conceptions of democracy and apply them to the activity of reconciliation. Reconciliation can thus be understood as an invitation to politics, to the possibility of building a shared community, without assuming from the outset its bounds or the terms of association upon which it will operate, or even that it will necessarily come to be. Within this space, we can debate what reconciliation means and how we will practice it, and allow whatever choices we come to to be open to contestation and revision as new voices struggle to be heard or new understandings come to light. Schaap describes this form of political community as a we that is not yet. His understanding of reconciliation rests on the notion that we cannot know where we are going ahead of time. Rather, political reconciliation is enabled by the promise of where we could go, the aspiration towards which we must embody continually in our deliberation and action. This approach challenges common understandings of reconciliation as the restoring of social harmony, a conception which has been widely criticized in contexts such as Canada, where it is questionable whether such a harmony necessarily ever previously existed. Schapp is insistent that we cannot take a united polity or a certain endpoint to the process of reconciliation for granted. To do so would be an injustice to those who are marginalized and disempowered by the current structure of relations, or those who have not been able to participate in shaping the terms upon which we live together. It would also be to ignore that a genuine attempt at reconciliation cannot assume its own success. Reconciliation could fail or be rejected. In the agonistic vision of reconciliation, politics is understood as an activity that takes place within a web of relations which requires everyone to share their perspectives and experiences with each other, to take each other's perspectives and experiences into account, and to reflect critically on how the positions of others relate to their own as they engage in political action. This practice of receptivity must be a reciprocal one. Or, as Stuart Motha reminds us, the rhetoric of reconciliation will merely reinforce unjust power relations and ma mask the underlying source of injustice. Paul Muldoon writes, this is a quote, reconciliation has called the non-indigenous community to remember and reflect upon its past, to think where it stands in relation to the suffering of others and how it might reconstitute itself to overcome the exclu exclusions that compromise its moral and political integrity. In circumstances such as the Canadian case, a receptive and reciprocal approach may involve being receptive to calls to broaden the ambit of reconciliation to address injustices beyond the narrow scope of residential schools. It might it mean embracing more socio-politically and economically holistic approaches to reconciliation instead of purely therapeutic or legalistic models by incorporating measures such as those implemented under the settlement agreement while not necessarily remaining limited to them. Above all, it requires recognizing that the nature of human interaction is such that circumstances change and relationships need to be responsive to that change. So there is no moment of conclusive resolution. Rather, reconciliation lies in the building and maintaining of the relationship. There is a distinction drawn from the work of Johann van der Walt that I find quite helpful for understanding the general orientation of this approach wherein reconciliation is conceived of as a guiding principle rather than a predetermined outcome. And thus we might understand ourselves to be living in reconciliation rather than seeking to be reconciled. Contrary to dominant Euro-Canadian understandings of treaties as land session contracts, indigenous visions of treaty relations, without getting into their internal diversity and complexity, generally present an understanding of treaties as ongoing, non-coercive relationships with and commitments in and to shared land and the other human and non-human beings that inhabit that shared space. How this vision of treaties differs from non-Indigenous understandings 
in many ways mirrors how the critics' vision of, reconcili of reconciliation differs from the state's approach. It presents an account of treaties as ongoing and open-ended relationships that are rooted in practices of receptivity and reciprocity, rather than as one-time agreements fixated on closure and achieving a final agreement. If we understand reconciliation as a way of living together through treaty relations, we can move away from accusations that reconciliation is a new form of assimilation because it imposes sameness, consensus, or an agreement that the past has been dealt with. Understood in agonistic terms, reconciliation and, <coughs> and treaty relations entail revisiting, renewing, and reshaping the terms of our association, allowing for deliberation not only within, but also about the nature of shared political community. As such, the politics of treaty relations are geared not towards building an agreement about a common vision of the good, but towards forming relationships through which we can live together with diverse visions of the good. Such a conception of the political relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples that brings reconciliation and treaties together, excuse me, <coughs> together, also allows us to overcome the disjuncture that I discussed at the beginning. The possibility of a more transformative reconciliation is better served by bringing the social, politi psychological, political, cultural, and material concerns together than by treating them as if they were separate issues. While both the treaty and reconciliation processes as they are currently conceived are beset by a variety of problems, I submit that the answer is not to abandon either avenue, but to develop a better understanding of the ways in which they are inextricably interconnected, and to adopt a more transformative approach of living in reconciliation, such as that put forward by agonistic democracy theorists. I believe that developing such an understanding of the ways in which the various aspects of colonialism are interconnected in Indigenous peoples' experiences is critical to recognizing the way in which they must also be understood <coughs> as connected in the manner in which non-Indigenous peoples take responsibility for colonialism and seek to establish a more mutually respectful relationship. This is but a brief consideration of theories of agonistic re reconciliation but hopefully this glance gives an indication of how this alternative conception of reconciliation might provide some insight for embarking on a more constructive transformation of our relationships with each other and indicate a way through some of the difficulties that many people have identified with respect to current treaty and reconciliation processes. I would like to um, conclude with two brief reflections that I think we should bear in mind as we consider how to live our theories of reconciliation in practice. The first is that while the theory I have sketched out today operates at a more abstract and general level, the, re the relationships through which we practice reconciliation and the treaties in which they are embodied are grounded in specific geographical, historical, social, and political contexts. And while there are certain threads that connect them all together, these contexts vary widely across the country. It is important that we engage directly and diversely with these contexts in order to arrive at a grounded way of living in reconciliation in our local communities, in addition to thinking about what reconciliation requires more broadly at the federal level. <clears throat> Secondly, the invitation to politics, to taking the leap that embarking on reconciliation signifies, which means both embracing the promise that reconciliation offers, while also in accepting the inherent risk that it may fail, it requires a foundation, an initiation. Our history together in this land is complex and full of injuries. And if we are to hope for reconciliation after centuries of broken promises, I think it is also important for non-Indigenous people to ask themselves how is it possible to build the trust that is necessary to enabling and supporting a process of reconciliation? And what responsibilities we bear for earning that trust? and demonstrating that we can engage differently than we have in the past. I was on this note really struck this morning um, by the imagery when Stephen Augustine was speaking, when he said that the aggressors must bury the hatchet first. So I think that kind of captures this, these questions. This is a set of questions that we must ask ourselves at multiple levels as we reflect on the transformation of relations at the federal level within particular treaty relations, and in our local communities. Agonistic theories of reconciliation 
Do not present us with a list of rules for how to go about this, but rather provide us with a way of thinking about reconciliation as a reciprocal, ongoing, and open-ended political relationship that can help to guide us in how we understand and engage in reconciliation. Um, with that, I will conclude, and I look forward to further discussions over the rest of today and tomorrow about what those relationships might look like here in this place and in the context of the Peace and Friendship Treaties. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn and Hannah. Um, any questions? Thank you very much. That's a great comment. One of the pieces that I didn't didn't talk about, but I gave you a hint of, was um, was this reverse test. And so I said earlier, um, you know, if we have an indigenous court and an indigenous judge and an indigenous panel, we look biased. But when you're not when you're not indigenous, you look impartial and objective. Well, let's take the test of um, moderate moderate livelihood. So with the Peace and Friendship Treaties and the Truck House Clauses, you have the right to barter and trade at certain places for a certain amount of things, but you don't have a right to go crazy with that. You can just have a moderate livelihood. Okay, let's, let's take the same treaty with the same people mm -hmm. and turn that around. Mm -hmm. What did you benefit from that? You have a right to be safe, but let's not go too crazy with that. You just can be moderately safe going to pull back what that safety meant for you at the time. Is that on the table? I don't think so. And if we often take the same standards and thresholds and spectrums that are imposed on Aboriginal people and say, how would this work if we translated that into what the non-Indigenous treaty parties benefited from? For example, um, you were not doing any mineral excavation at the time. So why now do you get to go into mineral excavation? That was not part of the, the discussion mm. at the time. There was no innovation around that in this territory at the time. Why do you get to evolve and, and grow into what those resources were? So just taking the same tests and flipping them and applying them to both parties would wreak havoc in our country. So, so we probably aren't going to go there, but it's a good question about what, what would happen if the shoe were on the other. And it would wreak havoc now because our government is in power. Our, our mm -hmm. government tells First Nations people still what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And it still controls our education. Mm -hmm. And our children and our identities. Yeah. And yeah. Good question. Thank you. Lisa? Hi, thanks. That's very thought-provoking discussions and presentations. I just wanted to add, because it got me thinking about um, one of the books that I use in my course, Out of the Depths, um, from Isabel Knockwood. 
and she just did a revised version of, of that book, and uh, part of it talks about the apology and how the Mi'kmaq people responded to the apology. Uh, that was part of her, her research. And the term that she uses in that, um, in that chapter of the book is um, a big sick dawagan, which is in Mi'kmaq. Um, I'm not totally sure if I, hopefully I said that right, I'm Malisee, so. <laughs> but a big sick dawagan, she describes it as a process where um, it's a reciprocal, and you talked about that reciprocal um, relationship where the perpetrator um, has to acknowledge what has been done, the wrong that has been done. And, and the person that has been perpetrated upon has to be willing to hear that and has to be willing to also say what that did to them. So it's taken that analogy that you used of the husband beating the wife a little bit further in terms of um, not only do I not do it again, but I ask you, um, how do we move forward together um, in a good relationship as opposed to just me not beating you anymore? Um, so I think that's the, the kind of where we have to get to, I think, in, in our relationship together in, in um, moving forward. Um, and also, it, it also got me thinking about uh, Bruce Trigger's um, writings upon um, how Aboriginal people um, existed prior to European contact in terms of um, living in consensus, living without jails, living without the law per se, as we see the law right now as judge, judge and jury and all that stuff. So can we imagine even a space or a place like that where uh, we don't need a legal system? Um, I don't know. I think that those are really big questions and, and, and how do we move forward in a way that is consistent with the way that, you know, because I'm the first one to admit that, you know, I've been assimilated and, I, and, and what I come with is, is a lot of colonized ways of thinking as an Aboriginal person. So how do we revitalize a healthy relationship based on mutual respect when it's very cloudy on both ends, I think. And I'm probably asking more questions than I'm giving any response to. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. Those are really good questions. And I, th I think we can both probably talk, talk to some of that. Um, yeah, uh, the work that I did, I was part of the, um, the treaty table negotiations that Justice uh, Arnaud talked about today at lunchtime. And so one of the things that happened in those negotiations where we were asked, okay, we don't, we don't think that Indigenous people are capable of taking on the criminal code, that's got to stay within the federal state, and, but we'll talk about justice. That was one of the list of seven that he had on there. What does that mean to you? What were the laws in your society? So we had to go into communities and interview a lot of elders and say, what does justice mean? So we're using Dene, Cree, Soto, Nakota, Lakota, Dakota, and we're then Machif, and we're trying to figure out, uh, I'm going home to my father who speaks Machif and go, what is, what is justice? And of course, there's no word that tra translate directly. There's concepts around it. And so we're really struggling with how are we gonna talk and translate this and have an open discussion about what those laws would look like and who's in charge of things. And so, and so one of the guys on the federal team eventually said to an elder, okay, like just tell us what your laws were. Like you must have had punishments for things, tell us what they were. And every time they would do that, the elders would say, well, that couple's having troubles over there. We send somebody, I can tell, got his eye on that other one, we're gonna go send someone and tell him, you get your eye off that other one, we're, you got a wife at home. <laughs> and she would tell him stories like that. Or um, um, kids taking things. Well, it's up to the grandmother to teach a lesson. And the grandmother would take the kids and she would say. Or, um, um, it was, you know, they would go on and on. But Canada was never satisfied with those answers and they pushed and pushed and pushed. And she finally, one of the elders said, the worst law in our society, the worst law to be broken was adultery. Mm 
the worst thing you could do was not to kill somebody. That person could be replaced with someone else. Someone else would pick up those chores and do that. Adultery has broken the family bond between the man and the woman, has damaged the children, has reached into the in-laws behind them and the children's friends and the friendships in the community, and now there's this huge trust. Who, do you have any idea how long it will take to repair every single one of those relationships? And the punishment for things like that was torture that I'm not even allowed to talk about. Genital removal that I don't even talk about. But we never had to do that very often because the old lady, she'd go talk to that man and say, you stop looking over there. <laughs> so what they were teaching us was prevention was what the laws were. But we were very capable of being quick and clean when we had to be traditionally. So, so I don't want to over-romanticize that it was too perfect for, for us the way it was, because the, the old people that I work with say there were harsh laws, and the natural laws were even far harsher. So we have notions of Pistahawin and Otsunawin that are very, very harsh. Uh, I just wanted to reflect a little bit further on um, both, both of you kind of raised some other concepts and that got me thinking about something I sort of wanted to um, say about reconciliation as a concept. Um, I'm only about two-thirds of the way through out of the depths right now, so I haven't made it to the chapter on residential schools yet. But um, So I'm, I'm now going to look forward to reading about that particular concept with great interest. But in English, what we are fixated on is this word, reconciliation. And my current research is, is focused on kind of trying to trace how, how that word came into our political relationships and, and what exactly different groups of people are trying to get at by invoking that concept. Um, and, and it's a little bit of a nebulous one because it means so many different things to different people in different contexts. Um, and uh, Aboriginal law scholar Mark Walters has drawn out, I think, a really helpful set of distinctions between different ways that that word gets used. Um, he calls them reconciliation as consistency, reconciliation as resignation, and reconciliation as relationship. Um, and all of those three are very different kinds of things that imply different kinds of relationships because reconciliation as consistency is kind of um, like you would use that form in financial accounting, for example, where you need to make two sides of something balance out, right? So you, they need to match, they have to be compatible or consistent with each other. How that happens could be symmetrical or it could be asymmetrical. It depends on whether you make adjustments to one side or the other. Um, <laughs> reconciliation as resignation is necessarily asymmetrical. It's where you know the situation is, and the only choice that you have vis-a-vis -vis that situation is whether you choose to resign yourself to it or not. Um, but reconciliation is relationship. That's, for example, if two people have a fight, if they are going to make up or reconcile, that can't happen until both people have agreed that the fight is over, right? It really, um, it requires that negotiation, that discussion about what happened, acknowledgement of what happened, discussion about where things are gonna go from now on, before both parties can say, okay, we are at some form of reconciliation here. If one party doesn't think that's where they are, then it necessarily can't have happened. And I think that third form is really what we need to be keeping in mind if we're going to use this concept of reconciliation to talk about our relationships with each other. Thank you. Last question right here. Thank, thank you. Um, I, I enjoyed the uh, conversation on reconciliation. I, I enjoyed the way that you pictured it, the way that you framed it, Marilyn. I, I thought it was, it was very good. But... I'm a, a little bit of a Marxist materialist, and I'd like to be able to see what the thing looks like. Like, where would we go to file an application to the reconciliation court? H how would this work? Uh, what would it entail? Um, one of the things that I've always learned and believe in is it's always the oppressor who determines the nature of the battle. Paul Frere. The oppressor always determines the nature of the battle. And the oppressor ha has only installed the litigation system. In other words, if Aboriginals have an issue, 
That's the only option that we have. And until the oppressor determines that there are other options, then I think we're stuck with it. So how do we, in your respected opinions, both of you, how do we get to that level? If we look at the government's stance on issues right now, if we look at uh, Swin Resources' stance on fracking, if we look at Sissenbrook's uh, resource on tungsten mining, if we look at TransCanada's interpretation of how the pipeline should be developed, reconciliation is not part of the vocabulary. So there are very few avenues other than litigation. So the question is, how do we get there? And what, do, what would it look like? <laughs> I'm a lawyer. I can give you several opinions. <laughs> Which one would you like? Um, it's a good question, of course. Can we get there and how do we get there? And the fact that it has to happen in a number of institutions, actually. It has to happen, as you heard over the lunch hour, in our education systems. And so my son, who is with me today, because dad's on some business in Saskatchewan, is actually really fortunate that he's one of the kids in Saskatchewan that's been exposed to the treaty education packages that have been developed by the Office of the Treaty Commissioner. And so treaty education is actually part of the education experience now, and so it's, it's, it's becoming commonplace for people to have an understanding about what those relationships were. Um, in terms of environmental issues, I think that there's some partnerships being developed um, that are going to be helpful. There's a excellent movie that's just been released about a young fellow named Caleb Ben, and the movie is called Fractured Land. And it's a young Aboriginal guy that's grown up in British Columbia, and his mom, uh, both Indigenous mom and dad, mom has worked for corporate development oil companies, and dad is a traditionalist, lives on the land, hunts, fishes. Caleb's grown up in both of those communities. And he talks, he's actually had to have reconstructive for surgery on his face, and he says it's because of con contamination through environmental damage. And he talks about the fact that he is internally trying to reconcile his life on a regular basis, and what does that look like? We know that the duty to consult, that everybody wants to talk about the duty to consult and who that relationship's with and what that looks like, is a very difficult conversation. And we've got all kinds of provincial and federal government offices running off to their own corners with their own peoples to develop what that looks like. We've got UNDRIP that was mentioned at lunch time to talk about free and prior informed consent, moving that duty to consult up a level. But the actual fact is the best relationships around duty to consult that have been formulated so far are the ones between corporations and indigenous communities. Because they, they don't have, corporations don't want to wait for this to go through litigation and deal with all that stuff. They're going directly into communities and saying, what do you need and what do you need right now? There's some examples out of, I think it is Denmark, that um, indigenous communities are coming together to talk about resource extraction and resource royalty sharing and in a way that's not happening anywhere in Canada right now. And so I think there's some international models that we could go to. But you know, we don't have a lot of indigenous tribunals here. I come from a territory where we have a Cree court, and we have a Cree judge, and he distributes Canadian criminal law through the Canadian Criminal Code. And he's the first person to tell you, I'm talking Cree, but I'm dealing with Cree law, period. However, they understand what he's saying, he can get to the heart of the matter quicker, and he can do things like say, Chief, I got four kids showing up on a fairly regular basis in my community driving without a license. It's a $250 fine. These kids are getting, um, it, they're racking these up. They're not paying their fines. They're getting breaches. This is, this is actually how, ch how young people enter the criminal justice system on things like this. It's breaches that get you involved more and more. And the more you get involved, of course, you become an expert in the system once you're, you're exposed often enough. So he calls the chief up, he says, it's 25 bucks for license, like deal with it. And the chief says, there's nowhere for them to go get a driver's license. The closest community is two and a half hours away, there's nowhere for them to go. And he says, then call the insurance guy. I'm sure SGI in Saskatchewan would love to take your money to train your kids. So the chief and this guy start talking. That's reconciliation. That's actually what that looks like. So, it might not be this big trumpeted red carpet celebration of judicial appointments and indigenous judges, 
but I think it's happening and I really encourage us to find out where and how to celebrate it because we're because we need some things to celebrate actually. Um, I just wanted to um, make two quick points about power I guess in response to the to the question about um, about the oppressor and the oppressed and I think um, absolutely it's it's critical to to recognize the oppression that has occurred. But I also think that when we talk about that, we need to be careful to also recognize that power is not an all or nothing thing. Um, and um, absolutely, indigenous people do have power and they do exercise it. And I think that is very evident by the fact that if you look at where we were 50, 60 years ago and you look at where we are today, there's the evidence of that because and I, I guess this gets back a little bit to our discussion about um, the relationship between litigation and reconciliation, because that is the avenue through which a lot of this has occurred. But if it were not for the active resistance of indigenous people through the courts or through participating in um, the formation of the UN Declaration, we would not have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, we would not have the legal advances that we, that we do have. Uh, and without the TRC, we would not have <coughs> the, the degree of knowledge that we are slowly starting to reach in the non-Indigenous community. Um, I didn't learn about uh, residential schools until I got to my first year of university. Um, that was eight years ago now. Last month, I went to um, a Maui Omi at Acadia University, uh, and we were in a session, and we asked um, who had heard of residential schools before, and almost every person in the so that's a big difference in the last eight years. If we hadn't had the, the fight that led to the settlement agreement and then had the TRC, that knowledge might not, might not have spread to the degree that it, it has at this point. Though we do need to recognize that we're, we're making advances, but there's a lot of work left to be done. Um, but So I just wanted to make that quick point about power not being all on one side. And I think we have, we have seen some changes um, because of that. Um, the other thing is to recognize that about the power that exists on the non-Indigenous side, that power doesn't necessarily need to all be exercised in the form of oppression. Um, and I'd like to hope that uh, there is an increasing number of non-Indigenous people who are exercising their power and their privilege to, to learn about the history, to learn about treaty relations, to teach their, um, their families and their friends and their colleagues about it. Um, and it's important for us to remember that there are, there are different ways um, that power can be exercised and we need to think critically about how we're each going to do that. Um, yeah, so those are my two good points about power. And that everybody brings something. I think you said this morning, we have to be sort of activists in our communities and that's how things are done. And we have to have our activists. We have to have our artists. We have to have um, people who are willing to work inside the uh, ANSI. Have to have all of those people, but you know Elijah Harper was one guy, one feather, and he absolutely put us on the stage. That's reconciliation. Like, I, I think we need to acknowledge where it's happening also in our community. That's a, a great insight. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn and Hannah, for, for very insightful and, and encouraging words. I, um, I really appreciate what you both had to say, and I think this is a really nice way to end this, this part of the discussion. And on behalf of the planning committee, I would just like to say thank you. Thank you.